Good evening. My name is Alexander Hagen. I'm the CEO of a small, medium-sized tech company in Silicon Valley. Previously, I was a financial analyst, financial journalist, and a research engineer in telecommunications. I filed several patents. Tonight, I want to speak to you about the alleged cover-up in the murder of the U.S. Ambassador Chris Stevens and three diplomats in Benghazi, Libya. The statements I'm about to make are not loosely researched opinions, but double referenced indisputable facts, and I put the references in the comment sections below. The narrative states that there was a protest that turned violent, and that the U.S. Embassy was attacked. This protest was sparked by the airing of this uh, video that was released that was about Islam, uh, that was extremely inflammatory. Now, the irony is that there was apparently no protest. It was a deliberately planned attack on September 11th by Islamic, uh, I don't even want to say Islamic, right-wing religious extremists that we armed and trained to overthrow Gaddafi. The arms and training of these people was done by the United States of America and turned on us, and it was not at all surprising. Additionally, another irony is that there was no embassy. This uh, facility was a rented building uh, that was used to coordinate U.S. activities there. These may seem, this may seem like a small detail, but it's an irony. It appears there was no protest, and there was no embassy. The Western press does not use many sources. There are dozens of local sources and Arabic sources, and these are seldom consulted. The fact is, we, the United States and NATO, along with our client states, Saudi Arabia and Qatar, trained the right-wing religious extremists who killed Chris to overthrow the Libyan government. I have now discovered that Turkey was also significantly involved in sending troops to Libya with U.S. encouragement, along with Qatar, in gross violation of the United Nations Resolution 1973 that we ourselves wrote. I will not repeat the excruciatingly detailed and numerous analyses and warnings I have tried to get out to the world via YouTube and my website Microtopia in the section Libya Conflict Analysis, as well as letters to the President and members of Congress, correspondence to those journalists that I could. The CIA apparently did a terrible job of informing Obama about Libya prior to decision to bomb it. <clears throat> Gaddafi's Libya, according to the United Nations Human Development Index, had the lowest crime rate, the longest life expectancy, the greatest equal rights for women, the longest number of years of education, virtually zero food insecurity, zero homelessness of any country in Africa or the Middle East, rivaling Chile and Argentina, and in fact had lower poverty rate than the United States, and uh, outperformed the United States in high school education statistics. Of course, Anyone who doesn't know this uh, will be incredulous, but I do put this in the footnotes in the comments. And Africans have been rightly over incensed over this invasion, as Libya was a significant investor in projects all over Africa. Libya was the only African country which had enough available free cash flow to build up African economies. The only African country. Of course, the West and China and so forth are pouring their funds in. Now, in the geopolitics, that will be emerging that your children and grandchildren will have to confront as you are confronting now in our deindustrialization and shift to China. In order for the U.S. to really be cornered, <clears throat> China needs a vast resource base. When you look at the United States, we have a huge amount of natural resources, a trained population, a state-of-the-art military, and an overall declining system in many respects other than that, although many people uh, don't uh, want to see this or don't agree with me on this. And Africa is key. If you take China and you link it to Africa, you have something that can beat the United States numerically. Uh, I'm not saying that we don't have the old uh, Yankee ingenuity, although I think everyone knows it's suffering greatly if it hasn't already disappeared. Um, so Libya was key to being able to block China from entering into Africa. Now, you may think this is a good idea if you're a person who uh, wants U.S. dominance at any cost. Uh, but if you research the matter, you'll find 
that alienating Africans to us. In other words, there's a strategic calculation by Hillary Clinton, the CIA, whoever it was that gave this wrong information, or whoever it was that took the right information and ignored it to invade Libya, uh, because this uh, created a recoil by many Africans. It may not be the African heads of state today, but educated Africans were horrified all over Africa, especially at the grotesque murder of the founding father of uh, Libya, whether you hate him or love him. He was the founding father of modern Libya, throwing off its colonial vestiges and dramatically improving the standards of living from 1969 to 1975. After that, it's a long story. We're not going to talk about that tonight. But if you look at the YouTube presentations I've done before, you will find the ones that go into the history along with the real news, which has an excellent historical analysis of Libya, although some of the work I've done uh, is uh, uh, complements or extends or enhances, and in some cases contradicts uh, the great um, Paul Jay at the real news. <clears throat> Africans have been rightly incensed over this invasion. The CIA, by obfuscating these facts, uh, when they presented their report to the president to make the decision to take a peacekeeping resolution and turn it into the utter annihilation of the entire Libyan armed forces, whose only crime was to support their government, and the soldiers, that certainly, um, uh, uh, or the administration by ignoring uh, a correctly prepared report, because we haven't seen the report, we don't know the mechanics behind these decisions, we haven't found out yet, we turned a wonderful opportunity to pressurize the Libyan government to peacefully adopt a constitution and institute elections, which certainly by June of last year they were prepared to do. Because Gaddafi didn't really run Libya any longer. It was a group of people around him. He was quite an old man at this time. And his son, Saif, uh, and his cousin, who was a spokesman, uh, for the uh, uh, Libyan government, if you go back and look at the press reels, um, Musa Ibrahim, these people had lots and others had, had the capability to get the deal done, to a uh, transition to elections, and they were uh, begging to put elections immediately because they knew they would do better than we thought they would. And you will see as history unravels. Now, people say that the, the reason the militias will not disband is because the government is infiltrated by Gaddafi supporters. What does this mean, infiltrated by Gaddafi supporters? Is our government infiltrated by Republicans or Democrats? People who have a certain political point of view are not infiltrators. Uh, Libya was not a country of, of, of thugs. There were thuggish elements. But if you go through the Amnesty International reports, the country had a 10% growth rate, but I get uh, beyond the point here. <clears throat> we turn this wonderful opportunity for a peaceful transition uh, uh, for a country uh, such as Libya after creating a ceasefire line, according to UN 1973, at Benghazi, cordon it off uh, and, and put a stop to the conflict, but instead uh, Hillary Clinton said that Gaddafi should stop killing his own people because we're much better at it than he is. He should just move aside and let us get to work. Uh, of course, I'm speaking cynically here. Um, and that uh, in order for us to have talks with Gaddafi, he has to go. And of course, you can't talk to somebody who's gone. Now, those who've watched my other presentations know I've made these points, but I have new material here for you. Now, in the case of uh, uh, Chris uh, uh, Stevens' uh, death and so forth, for God's sake, the Al-Qaeda flag was hoisted over the court in Benghazi months before Chris was killed. Now, what is this Al-Qaeda flag? It is a flag in the Islamic Emirate, a flag that represents a dream of a single Islamic state spanning from the shores of the Atlantic in Morocco and the Sahara, going all the way down to Indonesia and up into Central Asia. And um, if you look at the history of the Golden Age of Islam, they were very enlightened rulers, Harun al-Rashid, at the time of Sinbad, uh, in the, uh, around 800 AD, where they had gaslit street lamps, the highest uh, science in the world uh, in, in Baghdad. And now we allowed their libraries and all their manuscripts to burn as we guarded their oil embassies. Or uh, Suleiman the Magnificent of the Ottoman Empire. So the fundamental impulse to restore Islam's greatness is not one that involves necessarily uh, uh, murder. So I just want to make a point of the flag of the Islamic Emirate.
But nonetheless, an Al-Qaeda flag being hoisted over the source of the revolution once Gaddafi was killed it should be a indicator of who it was that we armed, the Libyan Islamic Fighting Group, a group of uh, religious extremists who fought in Afghanistan alongside Al-Qaeda and Osama bin Laden and his affiliates who fought in Iraq against the United States, who fought in the Balkans. Uh, and um, this cynical and sinister alliance with Saudi Wahhabism and Qantari right-wing extremism is extremely disturbing. The sinister and cynical alliance of the United States with these elements and NATO. The largest weapon sales in United States history about $80 billion worth occurred in the first two years of Obama's presidency to the Gulf states and Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia has the worst record of any country in the world on women's rights. Saudi Arabia encouraged the uh, right-wing elements in Libya, the Salafists, to destroy their archaeological heritage. I would tell you that the easiest job in the world that you could have would be to be the uh, head of antiquities and archaeology at Riyadh University, because all you uh, everything is, is as a matter of state policy, okay to just simply destroy. And Tariq Ramadan uh, is an interesting piece on press TV about getting these people to stop desecrating historical sites. <clears throat> So, we are now forging an alliance uh, with this ultra-conservative Sunni imperial war machine that is driving Iraq into an alliance with Syria and Iran, which right now all three, uh, uh, Assad, uh, is, uh, the Alawites are Sunni, and Syria, uh, Iran and uh, Iraq are both Sunni, uh, Syria, uh, uh, sorry, Shia majority countries. So, all three of these uh, power structures are Shia, and they're going to be lining up against the Gulf states. Now, Turkey is also Sunni, and Turkey is really a part of what we call BRIC, Brazil, Russia, India, China, because the real BRIC is the E7, which is Brazil, Russia, India, China, Indonesia, Turkey, and Mexico. And in fact, you'll find that a lot of the investment groups have cut BRIC out and have just focused on Turkey, Indonesia, and Mexico this year. <clears throat> Now, uh, Erdogan is a right-wing uh, religious extremist prime minister in Turkey. And he has thrown his lot in with these sinister forces. And it turns out that Turkey had a lot of troops on the ground, which is in violation of this uh, UN Resolution 1973 that we drafted. But we encouraged the Turks to send their special forces in, along with uh, over a thousand Qatari troops all the time denying there were any boots on the ground. And our, our poor, poor, poor quality media uh, never bothered to really shine much light on this. But I do post in the references a 200-page long document that you can download that I have created of uh, New York Times articles and so forth that leak out each and every one of the disturbing contradictions to the official party line. Uh, so Prime Minister Erdogan has thrown over 100 uh, leading military officers in Turkey into prison with sentences of 16 to 25 years, claiming they were plotting a coup uh, and, and furnishing CDs and documents stating they planned a coup around 2003. Uh, but one of my co-workers is a Turkish physicist, although uh, she works in different capacity for us, and uh, she knows about this because she is a secular Turk a follower of the modern Turkey's uh, founder, Kamal Ataturk. And the role of the military in Turkey is that if Turkey does get swept up by uh, uh, religious forces that try to uh, violate having a division between church and state, it's the military's duty to intervene. So obviously when you get uh, a conservative religious extremist prime minister, the first thing he wants to do is smash and hammer this group. It turns out that these documents that they claim were conspiratorial documents had graphs in them that couldn't have been made before 2005, two years after the alleged coup, had fonts in them that weren't even invented until 2007. So the material is fraudulent. And in theory, uh, plotting a coup according to the Turkish constitution, meaning being prepared to intervene against a religious takeover of the government, would actually be legal 
especially if it wasn't acted on. It's Plan X. <clears throat> Not only were these officers thrown in prison, but they were stripped of their patrimony. They weren't, they lost custody of their children, which has never occurred in the history of Turkey. It is such a bizarre concept. They were stripped of the rights to their own children. And this is a man that we're uh, in bed with. Additionally, of the four we have admitted were killed in the attack in Benghazi, because there are rumors that more Americans were killed, two of these diplomats were Navy SEALs. The Libyans we have put in power were shocked by how many CIA agents scuttled out of their holes in Benghazi as the airport in Benghazi was clogged with American CIA agents and contractors trying to get out of town after this amazingly powerful assault of 150 trained uh, effectively right-wing religious commandos that not only took out the embassy but went after the safe houses. When will we Westerners put in power wise and peaceful rulers like Ashok or Suleiman or Winston Churchill? Churchill was horrified at small countries being liberated by modern grim-faced iron armies of Italy, Germany, Japan, and the Soviet Union. I've read every word he has written on World War II, every speech he has uttered, and I'm nearly certain he would view this similarly to the fate of King Zog of Albania, who was liberated from the misery of independent existence by Mussolini, or the people of the Czechoslovak Republic, or the ancient kingdom of Abyssinia. You should listen to his speech, A Hush Over Europe, and see whether Mr. David Cameron, who went on Time, the cover of Time, and said, I'm David Cameron, and I love Winston Churchill. And uh, I'm not going to call David Cameron names, but I would very much be impelled to do so. Who has suffered in Libya? Women's rights have suffered. Libya had full equal rights for women. Blacks' rights have suffered. Blacks were massively lynched in false rumors, probably spread by our own intelligence services. Certainly our press encouraged completely unsubstantiated uh, claims. I watched every article come out painfully day after day. Anything said against Gaddafi was gleefully reprinted. Anything said to question him was squelched. But they did leak out. A hundred articles came out. Ninety of them were very loosely researched, all from two or three sources. Uh, all supporting the invasion. We've been fooled again and again and again. How many times can we be fooled? In Vietnam we were fooled. In Iraq we were fooled. Afghanistan is a complicated situation, but uh, anybody could have predicted this. I worked with two Pakistani uh, research engineers and they laughed at the idea of the U.S. thinking they could occupy Afghanistan. No one has ever occupied Afghanistan except one Sikh king once who was able to rule it peacefully in the 1500s because of his justice and wisdom. And not only blacks and women's and religious minorities rights, the Sufis, but history itself is under attack in Libya. We have armed people who are burning historical sites. The Saudis are pressuring them to destroy Sufi shrines. Libraries of ancient Islamic and Arabic documents have been deliberately burned. And we are writing a history of our intervention, which is false. So history is under attack in Libya. I wrote and recorded many pieces in the spring and summer of last year about the false media narratives. And now the re neocon Republicans themselves talk of a White House narrative. The precise words that I used a year and a half ago, this White House narrative. But they heartily cheered for this hot, false story. And the White House narrative that they're attacking is simply political manipulation. There's no difference between the Republican and Obama administration positions on Libya. Obama got caught uh, with this terrible incident, and now it's being made hay with. Now, there is an issue of competency here, certainly. <clears throat> now, when I attack the neocons, I do deeply respect true small government conservative Republicans in honor of my meticulous grandfather who believed in the Constitution and hard money and minding our own business and was not taken seriously by my own liberal father and uncles and aunts. Yet now a nation hearkens to that precise call under the banner of Ron Paul. I wish my grandfather could have seen Ron Paul, but I don't think he would have liked to see what's happened to our country uh, in the last 30 years. 
The people we installed in Libya now are attacking the strongest resistant point in Libya to the overthrow of their previous government, the Warfala capital of Beni Walid. And there is evidence, though not yet confirmed, that chemical weapons are being used on them. These are our people we put in power, and they apparently are using chemical weapons, uh, and some civilians have come in uh, with, with trembling nerves and odd-looking scars and burns uh, to the hospital in Beni Walid. The city is under siege, so the hospital struggling mightily. These people have courage. They are facing 10 to 100 times the military forces, and they are not giving up. The Warfala tribe, with Bani Walid being their uh, capital, is one-sixth of all Libyans. Libyans today, uh, that I've debated with, claim that tribal allegiances are not the primary factor any longer, but the rape and pillage of Bani Walid, its suppression, and the uh, going after the people and punishing them collectively for uh, supporting the previous government will outrage many Warfala, who may indeed have not considered tribe their primary allegiance, but it will certainly boil their blood now. Many of these people would have preferred to, regardless of the history behind it, to try to work to bring Libya out of its ashes into a brighter future. Uh, but this uh, attack on Bani Walid could easily drive people to uh, greater division. I wish all Libyans, regardless of their attitude towards the NATO invasion, for make no mistake, this was not a civil war. It was an insurrection that was exploited to annihilate Libya's defenses and install a pro-Western state in its place. Obama's wretched continuation of murder and plunder of Arabs and Muslims in their lands will no doubt be even worse under Romney. After destabilizing, assassinating, and funding right-wing death squads in nascent democracies in Iran, the Congo, Chile, Guatemala, Honduras, Argentina, Brazil, Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, Afghanistan, abandoning our Pakistani allies after demolishing a secular communist government in Afghanistan, arming and training Osama bin Laden, we do the same now in Libya and in Syria. And Romney writes a book called America, No Apologies. Romney should re read a few books written about America's intervention in developing countries in the last 50 years. He's practically called Palestinian subhuman, saying they had an inferior culture to the Israelis. And Obama has allowed serious war crimes that may lead to the deaths of a million people in Saharan Africa to occur by his administration because the destable of Libya is creating a very serious refugee situation. It's just like what happened in Iraq. In Iraq, people say nearly a million people died in Iraq. You'd think they died under one of the Bushes. They actually died under Clinton because under the embargo, after the destruction of the infrastructure, there was no potable water and there was no electricity. We destroyed their power plants. We destroyed their water purification facilities and then uh, we embargoed them so they couldn't sell oil. And uh, Iraq has $40 trillion worth of oil. And a um, major in the Indian Army I spoke to said he had uh, talked to Americans who had been in Iraq and they were taking, sending out ship after ship after ship of oil. They were paying, what they paid $50 for, they were selling at 400 Normally the commission on uh, Western companies selling oil is 10%. We're talking a commission of 80% of what this Indian major told me is true. So Obama's allowed serious war crimes that could lead to the deaths of a million people in Saharan Africa to occur by his administration. But apparently Romney would be far worse at carelessly shattering nations with war rather than diplomacy. We did not use our diplomats for diplomacy. We used them as liaisons in war and covert operations. Now we have no diplomats. I do not know whether Chris Stevens is a good person or part of this arrogance. In either case, he paid the ultimate price. One thing I'm certain of, though, is that if we had had an enlightened diplomatic policy in State Department, he would have worked just as tirelessly for the real good of America and Africa, rather than overseeing a catastrophic bungling. Just the latest in a string that have plagued us, particularly since the ominous rise of what Eisenhower warned us of, the military-industrial complex. Although he allowed several near genocides to occur by supporting an, the installation of right-wing military dictatorships in the name of fighting communism. Let us not twist Eisenhower into a prophet.
A prophet he was, but he helped let the genie out of the bottle, the genie of a corporate murder, murder industry, an America gone mad. For the average American, let us be clear, there are major consequences for you. A huge prison industry has emerged in this country, never before seen in the history of the world, other than in communist China and the Soviet Union. We have the highest incarceration rate in the world. A quarter of the world's prisoners are in the United States when we have 6% of the world's population. That money could be spent on reindustrializing our country, or research and development and poverty eradication. And the same goes for our grotesquely bloated banking and military industries. Imagine if this money was spent on reindustrializing and research and development and poverty eradication and schooling and so forth, instead of on these wasteful, uh, mind-boggling uh, thefts of money because you, the taxpayer, must spend trillions of dollars propping all this up. But the many companies involved, Halliburton, the oil companies, Boeing, Raytheon, General Dynamics, the banks, the consultants, Bechtel, they all profit. You pay four trillion and they bank four trillion. It's a direct theft and it involves the murder of hundreds of thousands of people, the destruction of history, the scarring of societies. America hasn't seen anything like this since the Civil War. I haven't studied the psyche of Americans after the Civil War, but I know that the psyche of these nations, had, you see, at least in the Civil War, the major powers didn't really intervene, luckily for us. In these cases, there's a sense of powerlessness for these people because it's the major powers that come in and call the shots. You pay for these wars that have doubled our debt and weakened our economy and our standing in the world unless you believe murder and fear uh, imposed on other nations is respect. It is not respect. And eventually the E7, that is Brazil, Russia, India, China, Indonesia, Turkey, Mexico, and others right behind them will turn on your grandchildren and extract a heavy price. Oh, Obama, Obama, Obama. Were you forced into these decisions by powers you lack the guts to confront the national security apparatus and its corporate beneficiaries and neocon political operatives? Or were you misled? Do you understand now how grievous your mistakes were? Did you realize hiring the lawyer Hillary Clinton to run our State Department? I mean, when you read the history of uh, Britain and you, uh, Churchill, the idea of hiring someone who's a lawyer and Apollo, well, it happened. But normally you have your State Department run by somebody who has a lot of experience in diplomacy. So you hired Hillary Clinton to run your State Department, thinking that you were following some Lincoln maneuver. And now we have put two people into power who thought they were geniuses into positions that they have displayed a stunning lack of vision and capability in. I weep for our country. As David Bowie's song in the movie The Falcon and the Snowman says, this is not America. Oh, <laughs> 